Um, my name is Ulrich Pagel. Um, I serve as convener of the AMA Traditions of Yoga and Meditation. And um, as such, I'm, I'm, I'm well positioned to, to answer questions about today's taster lecture as well as uh, about the program in the broader uh, perspective. Um, in, in today's talk, I have selected a, a, a topic that I think is of very great relevance to, to many of us. Um, and a um, good number will have heard of um, the concept of mindfulness or modern mindfulness, as it is um, sometimes uh, used, or it's as it is sometimes called. And um, I'd like to um, introduce modern mindfulness uh, through its role in, um, in, in the public uh, discourse. And um, modern mindfulness <laughs> has matured um, uh, over the last uh, 30, 40 years or so. The concept itself was coined in 1979 or so. Let me just look at my slides. For some reason, it doesn't go through. I think I might have used the wrong. Yes, here we go. So, um, modern mindfulness uh, is um, um, a concept that is um, increasingly well known. Uh, it has um, entered public discourse. It has um, began to um, appear in a, a great number of uh, domains in, in, in our life, in society in general. And the um, first slide gives you um, an indication of its um, popularity perhaps, but certainly of its presence in modern society. It appeared on Time magazine. We have uh, um, Congressman Tim uh, Ryan um, speaking about mindfulness. It appears in the um, FT magazine and in a number of other publications that are not normally considered to be um, sort of Buddhist meditation journals at all, but these are mainstream publications that all now begin to take note of modern mindfulness for its um, different applications, uh, different functions in the modern world. So clearly modern mindfulness is um, no longer a niche phenomena, but something that uh, has gained increasing um, um, presence over the uh, last few years. Now mindfulness um, is of course, not only um, modern mindfulness, but mindfulness is a concept that uh, goes back to um, the historical Buddha himself. He coined the term or the point or used the Sanskrit or Pali equivalent, sati or smriti for mindfulness. And it is interesting to see, to explore the degree to which the modern version of mindfulness correspond to the classical in interpretations of mindfulness. And for this, we probably need first to look at some of the definitions that we encounter today. The, um, the, the, the best known definition is probably that which was articulated by its founder, uh, John Kabat-Zinn, um, who in 1994 um, described mindfulness as a, a mean, uh, as a means paying attention in a particular way, on purpose, in the present moment, and non-judgmentally. So there are two key um, aspects or, inter or, or features of mindfulness in this interpretation. Um, and, and that is that it needs to be, according to Kabat-Zinn, um, focused or located in the present moment, and that it needs to be non-judgmentally. And these are very controversial attributes um, because according to the canonical interpretations of mindfulness, the Buddhist uh, interpretation of mindfulness, it is above all, an act of remembering. Both sati and the Pali or smriti, the Sanskrit, really mean to remember or memory recollection. They do not, in essence, um, refer to the act of focus or attention. Yet, Kabat Zinn firmly locates modern mindfulness in the present moment. And this raises an interesting problem to which we shall return in a minute. So the second um, interesting element is non-judgmental. Kevin Zinn says that modern mindfulness generates or produces a sense of non-judgmentality. Um, it, um, it, he introduces um, this concept in, in order to create a buffer between the event um, 
in which um, or which we encounter and the habitual judgments that we form about those events. And he said for modern mindfulness is essentially a practice that um, um, removes judgment from that experience. This is also very controversial and very difficult to align with traditional Buddhist concepts because in traditional Buddhist concepts, judgment forms a key part of uh, the individual's spiritual training. The individual needs to judge what is virtuous and what is non-virtuous and then needs to embrace what is virtuous. So the idea that mindfulness somehow has become non-judgmental as it traveled down the centuries into modernity is, um, is, a, is, is a difficult um, quality to reconcile with um, the um, um, classical or, or, or ancient interpretations of mindfulness. Now, let us um, look at, let us introduce modern mindfulness. It goes back to 1979, it was founded um, by John Kabat-Zinn, um, who then introduced it or made it core to a mindfulness-based stress redu reduction clinic at the University of Massachusetts Medical Center. It was designed to treat parent patients with physical or mental illness. And um, it grew over time um, into a center for mindfulness in medicine, healthcare, and society at the University of Massachusetts again. Um, 20 years passed since the inception of modern mindfulness as a therapy in 1979 and the foundation of the Center for Mindfulness in Medicine. It um, achieved its um, success through a series of government grants, grant, government grants that were aimed at the clinical application of mindfulness as a therapy. In order to secure those grants, Kabat-Zinn was very skillful in removing all Buddhist connotations from mindfulness. Buddhist connotations, the ritual, the uh, mythology, the um, religious practice were perceived to be um, a danger to the um, broadening popularity of mindfulness. So Buddhism was really extracted from mindfulness or mindfulness was extracted from Buddhism and was presented as a universal therapy that had very little bearing on religion or on Buddhism in particular. Kevin Zinn then set out to train um, certified MBSR teachers, mindfulness-based reduction uh, therapy teachers that um, became then active in over 30 countries. And he did this in order to secure the authenticity or the authority of his program. So he fairly rapidly um, moved on to, um, to, a, to a formal system of, of teaching, to a formal system of, of hearing um, that relied on lineage, on programs, on certification um, um, for its success. The question then needs to be asked, what is mindfulness for? In Buddhism, the answer is very easy. It's one single answer. In, in Buddhism, mindfulness serves to achieve enlightenment, enlightenment which reduces suffering. So in Buddhism, mindfulness has a very clear religious sociological purpose. Modern mindfulness in current society um, has, is much more varied in its application. It features um, in, in healthcare, it features in education, it features in the penal system, uh, in the workplace, and so forth. And many of these aspects were brought together in the Mindful Nation report that was produced in 2015 in the Houses of Parliament. Broadly speaking, in modern times, mindfulness serves to prevent depression, to support well being, to introduce resilience across um, the population. It um, serves in education to produce academic attainment. In mental health, it serves to achieve emotional regulation, to prevent uh, depression again, to build character, perhaps even. So mindfulness has a very broad well-being, uh, health, um, and um, attainment um, purpose in today's application. The early areas of modern um, mindfulness practice were not quite as broad. Um, when Kabat-Zinn set out in his practice, he really wanted to reduce physiological effects of stress, pain, or illness. 
So he identified very concrete areas of um, um, the absence of well-being and sought to mitigate them. He needed to do that in order to um, generate a set of criteria by which um, modern mindfulness could be assessed, could be judged for its effectiveness. Um, a good amount of his early work centered on the experimental exploration of those experiences and um, how, we, how emotional reactivity to those experiences could be better managed um, or possibly altogether eliminated. So equanimity was introduced as an, as an objective of mindfulness practice or equipoise perhaps as a better term. He sought to introduce a buffer between an event in our life and um, our reaction to that event. And this was then believed to generate a sense of clarity, a sense of serenity where the emotion would no longer um, override or um, govern um, our experience of a particular event. And this led to um, a, a series of um, uh, emerging or, or in part new, uh, a very well-known one formulated by Bishop in 2004 read the follows. Well, a kind of non-elaborative, non-judgmental, present-centered awareness in which each thought, feeling, or sensation that arises in the attentional field is acknowledged and accepted as it is. So, end of quote. What do we have here? The key word is accepted as it is. So we have the emphasis on non-judgmental awareness that combat an over-identifying with the experience that we undergo. It is non-elaborative, that is to say, um, it is um, an awareness that does not discursively seek to, um, to respond um, to, the, to the impulse. It aims to disengage from habitual compulsive patterns of um, reactivity um, that many of us experience in daily life, of course, as a matter of routine. So once again, the, the notion of a, the creation of a space, a buffer or a zone that somehow separates or isolates us from the experience that we undergo and, um, and, and, and thus sort of cut through um, the, the tendency of reaction and interpretation and the emotional response to those um, um, events. The roots of modern mindfulness do not go back to um, Massachusetts. The roots of modern mindfulness go back to the Vipassana movement of Southeast Asia. Um, here, the Burmese teachers of Lady Sayado and Mahasi Sayado were key contributors. They reformulated in many ways um, Vipassana meditation in the middle of the 19th century um, and um, prepared the way for um, Vipassana meditation to be um, adapted um, to, to a new set of parameters. Um, their teachings were carried over uh, from Southeast Asia uh, by American students, uh, Jack Cornfield, Joseph Goldstein, Sharon Salzburg, and others. And this happened a few years before um, Kabat-Zinn um, developed, or if you like, invented modern mindfulness. And, and Kabat-Zinn, did so really in continuation of the modern Vipassana tradition that um, these um, teachers, Cornfield, Goldstein, and so forth, had brought back from, um, from Southeast Asia. So there's a very close link between the Vipassana movements of Southeast Asia in the 19th century, um, the encounter um, of those traditions by a small group of Americans, who then uh, brought Vipassana to the West, to America, where Kabat-Zinn um, encountered it and then modified some of the Vipassana elements into modern mindfulness. So Kabat-Zinn is part of a much broader um, transmission, if you like, reaching from, from, the, from the jungles of Burma to the, um, um, to, to the um, West Coast of, of America, and at the East Coast um, afterwards. That, and much of that influence, uh, because it comes from Burma, um, 
centers around the Theravada tradition. There can be no doubt about it. But in Kabat-Zinn's case, um, his influence was not limited to the Theravada tradition of Burma. He too was influenced by other lineages within the Buddhist uh, tradition, the Vietnamese tradition, the Tibetan Buddhist tradition, and Zen Buddhism. The most important um, influence on his early life was probably Ishnat Khan, the Vietnamese lineage holder in the Tian tradition, which has some commonality with Japanese Zen Buddhism. Um, Vietnam is, in Buddhist terms, one of the most interesting areas of Southeast Asia because it um, brings together Mahayana Buddhism of East Asia, of China, and the Theravada tradition of Southeast Asia. And if you look on the map, you will see that Vietnam is really sitting on the cusp of those two traditions, of those two areas. As a result, um, uh, Thich Nhat Hanh um, adopted Theravada type mindfulness exercises, but gave them um, a Mahayana, especially Zen interpretation. And Thich Nhat Hanh, in the tradition of mindfulness, was probably one of the most important disseminator. His book, The Miracle of Mindfulness, published in 1976, was one of the landmark events. Um, but his work extended well beyond that, he founded terms like engaged Buddhism. He uh, was the first to use terms as like interbeing or, or even mindfulness at, um, in, in a global context. And Kabat-Zinn had studied with Thich Nhat Hanh and he really read his works and became influenced by, by, um, by his thought. So even though most identify John Kabat-Zinn as the founder of modern mindfulness, um, that is, not entirely true because um, Thich Nhat Hanh was, um, uh, through his publications, really uh, one of the first uh, person to, to identify mindfulness as a theoretic um, tool. Here we have the master himself, John Kabat Zinn. Um, Kabat Zinn was uh, not a um, spiritual person by, 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 by education, by training, he was a biologist molecular biologist. So he was firmly rooted um, in, the, um, in, 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 in medicine. He, he studied with um, a number of meditation teachers, uh, the South Korean teachers, Sang San was important, but he also studied um, with the Zen tradition and came himself a teacher in Zen Buddhism. He had a vision uh, in 1979 as he was participating in a Vipassana meditation retreat organized by Cornfield. And uh, as part of that vision, he saw um, the potential of mindfulness as the stress reduction tool. And this led then to the foundation of the stress reduction clinic um, in Massachusetts. His um, scholarship to begin with focused mainly on insight Vipassana in particular on the Vipassana influence on mindfulness. So you can see very clearly the, the link between modern mindfulness on the one hand and the Vipassana tradition as it had been brought to the US by Cornfield um, in, the, um, in the early 1970s. So when we look at Kabat-Zinn as a, as, as a founder of modern mindfulness, as a, as a, as a religious man perhaps, um, we not only see the Theravada tradition of Vipassana, but we also see Zen there. We see Tibetan Buddhism in the form of Chogyam Trungpa, and we see the Vietnam, Vietnamese tradition of Thich Nhat Hanh. And some of this may seem like a, a, a footnote, um, a, a, an observation of not great importance, but it, but it does matter, in fact, because it helps us understand some of the features of modern mindfulness um, that um, would, uh, would not be explainable uh, through a Theravada background alone. He describes his own practice, in fact, as a mix of Zen, Vipassana elements, now leavened by Dzogchen, and the MBSR method, method as Vipassana practice with the Zen attitude. So all elements are present in those definitions. Zen, Vipassana, Theravada, uh, and Tibetan Dzogchen. He um, based all of his early uh, teaching in the clinical setting. Um, he focused on patients with chronic pain, with AIDS, with cancer, 
And the, the aim always was to reduce suffering, to reduce stress, uh, chronic stress, um, as a result of those medical conditions. And while he understood as a man of science that mindfulness could not cure AIDS or cancer, it provided, in his view, um, um, an instrument, a tool to um, um, deal with the suffering, with the pain that sprang from those chronic physical conditions. He published his finding very eagerly. Um, many of these findings were published in scientific and medical journals. So he, from very early on, um, positioned mindfulness in the medical sector. This was his environment. This was where his upbringing had taken place. Now, in order to succeed in, in science, in scientific work, in order to succeed in a clinical environment, whatever you propose needs to be easily replicable. It needs to lend itself to scientific study. So the eight-week MBSR course that he developed was very formulaic in its conception. It was for formulaic in large measure so it could be replicable, so it could be tested by medical scientific um, um, studies. Um, it, he adopted his training course, in other words, to the environment within which he hoped to develop and in which he hoped to secure funding for it. Um, his best-selling book was Full Catastrophe Living, published in 1990, and that became somewhat of a Bible for modern mindfulness. Um, his attitude towards Buddhism developed over the years. Initially, he was firmly um, grounded in the scientific um, framework of his work, um, but then later on, he came to assert that mindfulness-based stress reduction must be grounded in universal dharma understanding that is congruent with the buddha dharma so in other words he began to introduce buddhist elements that um, will probably have shaped his very early uh, ideas about mindfulness but that he then needed to um, withdraw from modern mindfulness in order to gain acceptance and in, in his most recent publications he is um, Quite, um, quite open to, to acknowledge the significant impact of Buddhism on his thinking and, it's, um, and the, the way it, it shaped um, many elements of uh, modern mindfulness uh, application. And a good number of um, people have now began studies on Kabat-Zinn and his exposure to Buddhism. And it seems to be increasingly clear that um, to his own mind, Buddhism always played a role in, um, in mindfulness. What does mindfulness-based stress reduction look like? It consists of a combination of formal practice on the one hand and informal practices. The formal practice consists of a body scan, of mindful movement, walking um, or, or other um, movements. It involves sitting meditation where the individual observes the breath, observes the body, the sounds, uh, observes his thoughts, um, which is then called um, a, a choiceless awareness, awareness that does not um, engage in, in, in choice or, or selection. Loving kindness became increasingly uh, integrated into mindfulness-based stress reduction. And that itself is a very interesting addition because Loving kindness as such, as an emotive practice, has really no role in the Buddhist context of mindfulness. But loving kindness has a key role in vipassana, or at least in modern vipassana, um, on which kabat drew in his early work. So the inclusion of loving kindness is, is probably um, the result of the influence of his early vipassana context in the, in the mid-1970s. Informal practices abound. They abound in particular in the daily life. Uh, it's about mindful eating, mindful routines, so brushing the teeth, um, getting dressed. Um, he aims to bring awareness to the daily experience in thought, whatever it is, and uh, to help us analyze um, whether an event is pleasant or, or unpleasant, and then introduce a buffer uh, to the emotional response 
um, to that um, experience. The formal practices often um, take place in group sessions. Uh, we have normally eight times two, two and a half hours um, plus a retreat day. Um, teachers and participants um, collaborate, interrogate each other. So the teacher plays a very key role in those sessions. And home practice usually is encouraged to last about 45 minutes a day. So we have an eight day training session of two, two and a half hours um, each day, um, followed or accompanied by teacher participants interaction. Um, and then uh, that is continued at home, um, uh, be it at a reduced level. And these practices um, apply to wherever you encounter mindfulness-based stress reduction therapy. Um, no matter whether you uh, take a course in the US or you take a course in the UK or elsewhere, you, you will encounter a high degree of consistency in those practices. Mindfulness um, took off as a result of kabat success um, significantly. And here in front of uh, this chart, you have a, um, a graph of the research studies per year between 1994 and 2015, and um, the, it could be extended to 2021 with a similar trajectory. So you can see that in 1994, only a small number of studies had taken place that began to rocket really around 2004. Um, 2004 was an important event because it marked the foundation of the Mind Life Institute. Um, the Dalai Lama became interested in modern mindfulness. Richard Gere contributed. So sometime in the mid 2000s, um, a great deal of publicity um, was given to mindfulness, modern mindfulness, and um, the interest in research surrounding mindfulness um, as a result um, spiraled. There's one other form of modern mindfulness that we need to examine, and that is mindfulness-based cognitive therapy. This is um, a type of mindfulness practice that um, in involves um, elements of um, psychotherapy, cognitive therapy. And it is essentially designed to, to help participants to guard themselves against mood changes, to, to deal with recurrent depression. Uh, it was founded by Siegel and Williams, as well as Teasdale, uh, who all come from the clinical domain of psychotherapy. Um, it is um, based uh, mainly in the UK, where we have uh, the uh, Oxford Mindfulness Center, um, which is the, the, the hub of all um, mindfulness-based cognitive therapy in the UK. It was approved by the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence, which meant that um, it could be prescribed to the NHS. But provision... is very patchy. Apologies, everyone. We seem to have lost Ulrich there with uh, internet connection difficulties. Um, but while we're waiting for him um, to get back online, if anybody has any sort of general questions about SOAS, do feel free to enter those in the Q&A section. 
Um, I'm also joined by Nahinda here as well, who's a current student. So I said, if you have any questions for her about her experiences as a current student, do let us know. Hi guys, I am Nahida. Uh, I'm the student ambassador. Don't be shy at all. Anything you want to ask, that's what I'm here for. Um, whether it be student life or um, just, just the general vibe at SOAS, I can give you answers and I'll try and be as honest as possible. So don't be shy. How have you found your year this year of, of, of online learning, Nahida? Well, it's been different and because it's kind of like the first of its kind, it's it's hard to compare to anything. So from my experience, I'd say it's going well, but you never know. Each year will just get better and better. And hopefully Corona dies down a little bit. So we won't have to get to the point where it has to get better and better. But, um, you know, even 1% of progression is improved. Even 1% of improvement is still progression. Um, but yeah, I think at the beginning of the year, everyone was struggling because we just weren't used to it. But um, especially where unis like us, we're being very campus based because you have unis like the Open University who have obviously done it online. But I think SOAS has picked it up really well um, and we've caught up because I've, I haven't had that many issues at all, other than the slight technical issues on my part where like my Wi Fi will be down or something. But I think that's just a general worldwide issue. Other than that, um, yeah, SOAS has been really good in terms of keeping up with the time. <laughs> And perhaps it, could you mention a little bit about sort of any extracurricular things that you do at SOAS, um, any society you're part of in the student union? Yeah, I actually, when I joined, because of how the year was going to be, I knew it was going to be remote. I had, I had low expectations, I'll be honest, of extracurriculars and societies because I just assumed most things will be, you know, when you're in person. Um, but that was completely the opposite. I'm a part of quite a few societies. Um, first one the first thing I joined was the SOAS spirit which is kind of like our um, newspaper our school newspaper uh, which is completely student run um, and at first I was a bit confused I was like how are we gonna put together a whole paper from from our homes I was very confused but um, it was very innovative actually like we used to do it on google docs and well, then the editors can edit on the Google Doc, and it was it was actually very interesting. Um, so I've written two pieces so far for the, for the newspaper, which was really interesting because I do want to go down the journalism path. And then I also um, I'm part of this peer mentoring scheme. So me and my mentor, she's in she's currently in year um, the third year, um, and she does politics. And she we will have like. Um, Zoom sessions quite often just to she checks up on me and she just asks me how I'm finding stuff and I remember I was when I was first handing in my assignment um in turn it in I was completely confused I did not know what I was doing at all because I was um because I missed one of the um the buttons it was just completely I just did not see it so I remember my mentor took control of my screen and she was like I can literally see the button I was like oh I was like oh no she's like no that's fine that's what I'm here for so it made me feel at ease because sometimes it's inevitable to um feel a little bit intimidated by um the staff and teachers that's with any anywhere anywhere you go anyone new you just feel a little bit intimidated but um it was nice to have a student body that was really um engaging um so that really helped me in the beginning and how do you sort of find the, the SOAS community? I guess it's, yeah, it's, it's a bit tricky if, if you've not been on campus this year and not, not had that experience on campus this year, but um, in general, sort of, what's the SOAS community like for you? Um, I'm, like you said, we haven't been on campus, so I don't know how the campus community is, but in terms of SOAS community in general, um, it's actually, considering we're online, it's actually quite, um, what's the word I'm looking for? there is a community <laughs> that's what I'm trying to say because we have whatsapp groups for each of our subjects and then we have mini whatsapp groups that stem from there um, for our tutorials and then you'll hit it off with someone because we're going to breakout rooms quite a lot which is something that you wouldn't really get if you were um, in like on campus you'd have to obviously you'd have to it'd be more organic but this way it forces you to talk to people and um, so people I've spoken to and I've actually become quite close to and I remember them saying 
or if we were in real life then I probably wouldn't have spoken to you because I'm quite shy and I don't really like talking I always keep to myself but because we're in the breakout room I was forced to talk to you so I guess that's a plus of being online people are a little bit more confident maybe like behind the screen they they're in their place they can you know speak their own okay great thank you Nahida so if anybody does have any any more questions for for either of us please do please do let me know um, I work in the student recruitment team so if you have any questions about admissions or um, any other aspects of SARAS uh, do let us know in the Q&A uh, we are trying to get Ulrich back but it does look like he's having a few internet um, connection difficulties um, so if we aren't able to get him back this evening, uh, you can always contact Ulrich on his email address, which is up1 at soas.ac.uk. So that's up and then the number one at soas.ac.uk. Um, so if you did want to ask him any questions about anything he's spoken about this evening or about the programme, uh, you can contact him that way. Um, but as I said, we are trying to get him back just for a short Q&A at the end of, of the session. Um, so bear with us just a couple of moments. Um, but if you do have any other questions in the meantime, do let us know. Perhaps you could talk a little about um, your contact hours, Nahida, and how many contact hours you have a week and sort of roughly how much study you do outside of your class time a week. Um, well, because of the way we are online right now. So half of my, um, cause I do a double, I do a joint on it. So I do development studies and politics. So half of them are recorded and then half of them are live. Um, so first I make sure I do all my reading beforehand and I'm, a sl I'm quite a slow reader. <laughs> so I, oh, I think I'll mix back. Uh, it looks like you're back with us, Rick. <laughs> Um, you may be on mute though at the moment. So what happened to the connection? I'm not too sure. I'm not too sure what happened to the internet connection, um, but we're back now, so that's good. Um, okay. Um, but when, when did you lose me? Uh, we lost you on the slide um, regarding, um, I'm, not too, I'm not too sure, but it was, about, it was about two minutes ago that we lost you. Um, okay, so it's not too bad then perhaps. Very good, so um, I'm available for questions now. I don't see the Q&A as yet, where would that be? It was, the um... Q&A is on the, on the, uh, oh, yeah. okay. the bottom of the screen. Yeah. Yeah. I have enough. Okay. Nahida's just been talking a little on her experience of being a student at SOAS as well in the meantime. Okay. Very good. At the moment, I don't see any question. Doesn't look like we have any questions um, just yet from uh, the participants this evening. But if you do, if you do come up with any questions, do feel free to write them in the Q and A box, um, whether they're related to Ulrich's talk this evening, or more generally about the program and the structure of the program, or more generally about SOAS as well. Maybe, maybe in the interim, I can say a few words about the program. Um, the, the program falls really into two components. On the one hand, we have an, a number of um, modules or, or courses that um, focus on very specific aspects of yoga and meditation. One module is called the Buddhist uh, meditation in India and Tibet. Another one is um, um, called or deals with the origins of yoga and its development um, in ancient India. So these are fairly closely uh, prescribed modules. On top of that, as at all MAs at source, you have an opportunity to select open modules. Open modules in principle give you access to any master's course, master's module that is being delivered at SOAS. And then uh, the, the, the degree yoga meditation, a very popular combination or very popular choices open module would, for example, be learning Sanskrit or Tibetan or any other language that connects to your own interest in yoga meditation. And picking up Sanskrit through this MA will allow you to enmesh your own research much closer with the traditions of yoga and meditation 
um, in, in, in India, in Tibet, or, or possibly even beyond. So that is, that is a very good um, opportunity to, to, to deepen your, um, your skills um, that you may, may want to develop as part of your study. The dissertation is the, um, the, the crowning uh, production of your masters. It um, accounts for um, a third of your credits and it provides you with a unique opportunity to um, really develop and to engage with your topic of your personal interest in yoga meditation. You could write, for example, a dissertation on modern mindfulness. You could write a dissertation on um, the um, Patanjali Yoga Sutra. You could explore specific aspects of Tibetan meditation. And we will provide you with the skills and the supervision to realize those um, dissertation plans. And, and if, you, um, if, there's, if you succeed, if they succeed at the very highest level, as I uh, said earlier, you, they could lead to publications. We had so far um, three, four public uh, MA dissertations that were um, um, published in peer-reviewed journals and that le then led to, um, to PhD work and, um, and, and further studies. So the MA can both be a, a degree um, um, independent for its own benefit with its own value, but it can also become a stepping stone in a much broader and a much wider um, development of your studies. And um, every year I have students who, uh, who take up that opportunity. Thank you, Ulrich. It doesn't look like um, we have any questions, but if anybody does, oh, okay, we, we do have one from Miranda, who's asked, what is the difference in the ways mindfulness is practiced in Kabat-Zinn style compared with the cognitive therapy style? Yeah, um, thank you, um, um, Miranda. It's a very, very good, very important question. The, 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 the cognitive therapy um, aspect is, is much more focused on, um, on, on depression. Um, it does not really set out to, to engage um, with, um, with physical stress, physical pain. And, and, and as a result, the form of mindfulness that is um, developed um, or promoted within the cognitive therapy is, has a much stronger sort of mental or emotional uh, focus, let's say, than, um, than, than, than the physical focus. The, the principles that underlie cognitive therapy are, are very similar to um, the, if you want uh, the mainstream or regular mindfulness-based reduction um, therapy, but the, 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 the objectives, the focus is different. And um, some aspects of the, the training as a result are also different, but the underlying principle is very similar. It's the creation of a buffer um, between an, an, an event um, and uh, the emotional reaction to, to that event. Mindfulness, based stress reduction in its cognitive and non-cognitive uh, facility is really designed to sever that near automatic um, response that, that most of us, maybe all of us have to um, events that, um, that, that we experience. And by doing so, it uh, allows the, the patient or the participant to, um, to manage those experiences better. Okay, I think I think that might be all of the all of the questions that we have. Um, unless anybody has any last questions. If there's nothing coming um, through today, then just let me um, let me conclude by saying that um, I'm of course available for for further inquiries, further further questions um, outside this webinar. Um, I um, have routinely um, office hours, surgery hours that, uh, which, that are used to, to talk about uh, the program uh, with prospective students. We can hold them in Zoom, we can hold them uh, by email, or hopefully before long they can take place again on campus, although we're not quite there yet. Um, most students come to mindfulness, come to meditation, to yoga with very individual, very specific um, study aspirations, and I'm, I'm most happy to talk you through uh, those aspirations and find out with a source uh, 
um, is the right place for you to, to realize uh, those, those aspirations. I have access to a number of students uh, from the current school and we'd be most happy to, um, to share with you their experience studying towards the program, um, either as part-time students or full-time students. My email address is probably available through the event today, but you can simply Google me on my, in my source email address will then pop up uh, um, very early on in, in your search. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Ulrich, um, for a really get engaging presentation this evening. Um, and thank you as well, Nahida, for being here as well. And thank you to all the attendees for, for coming along to the session. I hope it's been really useful and um, enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you. Thank you.